Thank you all for being here. I'm Lucy Beebnell from the Arc of Northern Virginia, joined by Diane Monig, our absolutely amazing transition manager with the Arc of Northern Virginia. And for Housing Month here in April of 2022, we thought right away what made sense to do was to reach out to the amazing team at Safe and Home, from whom you're going to hear today. The folks here have done just the coolest things, kind of like cutting edge ideas about ways to make sure we're maximizing independence and safety and support, which are sometimes hard things to pair all together for folks with developmental disabilities who are living great lives in the community. And so without further ado, we are going to turn things over to Andrea Vincent with Safe and Home and her team. Andrea, please feel free to take it away. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. I'm Andrea Vincent. I am the district manager for Safe and Home in Virginia. Um, we work very closely with Lucy and Diane and the ARC. Um, we're very proud to be here representing Safe and Home and the ARC. And our goal today is really to show you guys some very specific examples of successful moves into more independence and even into independent living. Um, these examples will showcase individuals that we have actually worked with here in Northern Virginia. I've changed the names, but these are individuals that, that we've worked with. And you will see exactly from the planning stage to moving out on their own or testing things out in their um, home family environment, how it worked, what it looked like, pitfalls that they came upon, um, and um, the successes in the end. So I wanted to introduce the team really quickly. We have Beth Bullard. She's account executive for the Loudoun area. Uh, we have Melanie Shoemate. She's account executive for Prince William Rappahannock area. We have Kashala Cole, who is part of Northern Virginia account executive. And we have Melissa Blackburn, who is our community development representative, our CDR. And she is she's pretty much our advocacy voice for Safe and Home. So I am going to first let Melissa start us off. And I thought that she would be a great person to talk about community inclusion because she has 19 years of experience working with people with developmental disabilities. And 14 of those years, she was actually in a congregate residential setting. So a group setting, a group home setting. So Lucy, if you wanna go ahead and start the show. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to pop those in the chat. We want this to be super interactive. I'm gonna do a little bit of whiteboarding um, on one of the initial slides. So we will be asking you guys to answer a couple of questions for us. All right. I'm going to start sharing our screens now. Zoom is giving me a weird option where instead of allowing me to share just the PowerPoint, it's asking me to share my whole screen. So I'm gonna bring it up. I can't see what you're seeing to state the obvious. So if you see something other than after a second when I get this whole screen shared and then the PowerPoint slides up, you let me know and we will strategize. But if you can see the slides, give me a little nod or thumbs up. Okay, super. So I'm gonna go on mute and I will just listen for your cues on turning the slides. All right, that's perfect. Um, so again, if you wanna go to the next slide, we will have Melissa kick us off. Well, thank you, Andrea, for the introduction. And thank you to our friends at the Arc of Northern Virginia for uh, inviting us to be here today. We um, are very excited to provide this service here in Virginia. And everyone has the right to live in a fully integrated life in the community. Everybody has the right to go to school, work, enjoy recreational activities, and to be active as well as to uh, build a sense of community with your neighbors, your friends, um, whether you come from a faith community, et cetera. And everybody wants to be a contributing member to the community because the community belongs to all. I do apologize, my, my dog is in the background. She's not happy, she's not part of this. Um, we all want integration and we all want access and choices. And in Northern Virginia, we have a lot of easily accessible um, variety of activities, uh, ways that everybody can be part of the community. Next slide, please. And our goal is to help support individuals with disabilities to live as independently as possible. And as you know, independence looks different 
for everyone. Housing looks different. You could be living with your family. You could be living with a roommate. You could be living with an upset dog who wants to be right here. Again, I do apologize. Or you could be living alone. We're not making a deep dive on to secure housing options. We are here to talk about our supports and our solutions to help during that process. We will provide a down, downloadable PDF with links to more information about these things. So we're not experts on all the different housing options, but we can help link you guys up to other uh, resources. And I'm sure Lucy and those who are at the ARC can help provide that direction. We want to accomplish, our accomplish is to make sure that you guys feel that this is a possibility for your loved one and ready to consider greater independent living. Next slide, please. Thank you, Melissa. All right, so first, before we really dig in, I want everyone to clear their minds, remove that initial no, my adult child cannot do this. So when you're hearing success stories and when you're hearing about other people doing things, sometimes we just assume either we can't do that or that's not the exact scenario that we're experiencing or no, my child looks completely different from that. So we want you to clear all of those assumptions out of your mind. We want you to focus on what your individual, what your loved one can do and what they want to do. We want you to fast forward to the future. They may not be ready to move out today or tomorrow or next week or next month or even next year, but eventually they will want more independence and they, they may want to move out on their own. So think about the future. This doesn't have to be today. And then the first thing we're going to do is we're going to convert all of the barriers, all of the things in your head that says, I can't, or they can't, and we're going to turn those into goals. So we're going to remove all of those negative thoughts, all of those barriers, whether mental, physical, and we're going to turn those into goals right here on the spot. So next slide, please. All right. So um, Lucy, if you want to be the person to type things onto this screen, I'm thinking we'll just do a list on the left of barriers and then how we can turn those into goals, a list on the right. You can either write it on a whiteboard or just do a text box on the slide. Does that sound okay? I'm trying to get Zoom to let me. Okay. I think oh, well, there may be a whiteboarding option. I see a pen choice. Oh, let me go back here. And so for the pen, I can choose a laser pointer or a pen. Who okay. knows how my handwriting is going to be, but we'll figure it out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's why I wanted you to drive. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll try this out and see how it goes. If not, somebody on my team can make the notes. Um, so what I really want to do is turn this into more of a workshop by digging deep into the things that are holding you back um, and let you feel more com confident about taking that next step, basically. So all of you answered a couple of questions when you registered. And one recurring theme that I, that I saw was safety. Now, safety is a broad category, right? So if someone would pop into the chat, what is it about safety that is your biggest concern? Is it stranger awareness? Is it um, you know, letting strangers into the home? What part of safety is a barrier that's making you pause on taking that next step? So anybody can just pop it in the chat. Ooh, we're All getting right. good ones. <laughs> okay, so let's take a couple of those and I'll let um, Kashala, Melanie, one of you want to just um, reveal those one at a time and we'll turn those into goals. Okay, so the first one we have is good communication and attentiveness on the part of the house staff to parents. Okay, so this would be more in a, um, a group setting, it sounds like. 
and it talks about communicating amongst the staff and the family and the individuals, it sounds like. So how can we make those goals, you know, turn that barrier into a goal? With that one, it's less about, you know, using technology and things like that, but I would assume that if you got everyone on the same page, which we're gonna talk about in a couple of slides, had maybe a monthly planning session, kind of like the ISP meetings that you're used to sitting in on, have a planning session, get everyone on a Zoom so nobody has to show up somewhere on time and just talk about what is working, what is not working and get all of the supports and all of the providers involved in that communication. And again, we are gonna talk about that again in a minute. So what's another one? So the next one we have says, fear that my son will be taken advantage of. He trusts easily. Okay, exploitation is huge and it is real. Um, so we have a lot of technology that can help um, avoid exploit exploitation, keep someone safe from exploitation. A really um, simple, I guess, example would be a video doorbell. Someone comes knocking at the door. The individual doesn't know who it is. They try to convince them that they're a friend or a neighbor and, oh, just let me in. I want to help you with, you know, such and such, or I baked you a cake, whatever the, the situation. If they have a video doorbell, then they're learning to pause, see who's at the door on that video camera. Um, they have an app on their phone. You can actually have the same app on your phone and talk about who's at the door. Do we know them? Is it a stranger? Um, and then make a better choice of whether or not it's safe to open that door. So that's just one really simple example. We also have you know, devices that if they're out in the community and someone approaches them, if they you know, get flustered or anxious and can't think to use the cell phone in a situation like that, then they, we have devices that they could just push a button to reach out for help. Yep, and Melissa's holding it up there. Also, I was thinking the other day that if someone's actually wearing that around their neck and a stranger approaches and they see, it says SOS and there's a big red button on it, you're not gonna mess with that individual because you see that they have a button that they can push. Um, so that may deter someone from approaching them. Um, what's the next example? Or the all next right. So the next one is um, pretty much all of it. Son is non-speaking and impulsive. So there's all that. Okay. That's a good one too. Um, so we are going to see a video with one of our individuals who is non-speaking and you will see the types of things that she uses in order to um, live independently. She actually has a roommate. Um, so I think we can get more into an answer, uh, some goals for that situation as we look at the success stories. So I'm gonna kind of put that one on hold for now. Any others? Um, the next one is safety awareness and response to emergency. Okay, so emergency preparedness is huge. Um, when we bring individuals on service with Safe and Home, and I'm sure other providers do this as well, we go into great detail with the family, the entire care circle, other providers, and the individual is in the, the forefront of, of this conversation about, do they know what to do in an emergency? Um, as soon as we bring someone on service, we develop a care plan and it's extremely detailed. It pulls things from the ISP. We know all about them medically, all about their needs, their goals, their abilities, their disabilities, everything about them. We also have an emergency plan that we put into place. So if they were to reach out to us, we would know, should we call local 911? Should we call mom first? And we can even have a call tree that we go down just to make sure that that we know what to do, that they know what to do, instructions on, okay, if, it, if there's a fire and we would have it on our computer screen, you need to go out to the parking lot and meet Mrs. Jones, who's in the apartment next to you, and make sure that you stay there with Mrs. Jones until someone tells you to do something further. Something like that would be a good example. Okay. okay. So I'll do the next two, because one's just funny. Um, so <laughs> she put all of it, LOL. And then the next one is family planning on what to do in case of an emergency. Okay. And that, that was kind of, kind of lumped into the last one. And we'll hear more about that again with the success stories. So what's the next one? 
I'm concerned she will just stay on her computer 24 seven. Ah, okay, very good. We hear that a lot too. If someone moves out on their own, are they going to just stay inside? Are they going to then have you know loneliness to contend with? Um, because we're all living in a virtual world, um, we're gonna talk about a service that we have called Remote Supports. And it is basically having a virtual DSP. I don't know if you all are familiar with that. DSP is direct service professional. So it's like an aide that comes into the home, but we have aides that are virtual. So they can talk to them day, night, 24 seven, they're accessible. But one of the other things that we do is we can encourage someone to get out of the house, to turn off their electronics. Um, you know, so it's almost like having mom or dad there or a friend or, a, you know, some other support and encouraging them to, hey, don't forget, you need to walk the dog, um, things like that. Or it's a beautiful day outside today. Have you thought about going out and taking a walk? What are your plans for the day? So we do have ways to support them and encourage them to, you know, not hole up in their apartment. But we're also going to talk about another type of apartment living um, that's called cluster living. And that is where they are, well, I don't want to talk about it yet in too much detail, but it is where you're in an apartment complex with other individuals with disabilities in a cluster or row of apartments, and then you can have group activities. So it's not a group home, it's not congregate living, but it's, it's clustering individuals together so that they have their community. Okay, so I'm gonna stop with this um, for now because we could probably do this all day long and I love it. Um, but let's keep moving and we will come back to some of these a little bit later. So Lucy, next slide, please. All right, so beginning the process. We have talked to providers. We have talked to care circles, families, individuals, everyone to come up with these lists of pre-planning of what should you do right now to start planning for the future. So first you're gonna identify the goals. Do, does your um, adult child, um, are they social? Do they need to be in a highly social environment? Um, what are their safety goals? What are their, you know, just goals in general? I know one individual that we brought onto service, his name is Ben. And through our consultation process in the very beginning, when we sit down with the individual and ask about their goals, he said that his number one goal, um, and he's non-speaking, has autism. His number one goal was to go to the grocery store by himself. He'd never done it. And that was his goal. His mother had never heard this goal before. So she got a really big smile on her face. And um, so that was one of his goals. So she knew, okay, well, he needs to be in an area that he can walk to the grocery store. He can't be out here where I live in Warrington with the cows. <laughs> he needs to be in the city. Um, so identifying the goals is, is huge, number one. Number two, get your support coordinator involved as soon as possible for the planning because they may have ideas and resources and they're also overwhelmed and overworked. So the more you're a little, you know, a bug in their ear, um, the more helpful they can be. Create your circle of support. So think about when you're not around or if you're out of town or out of reach, who else can your loved one depend on? Is it a teacher? Is it someone who works at the local fire department, neighbors, friends, um, people at church, whomever, and write that list down, communicate with those people and make sure that they're on board. Next up, there's something called a housing guide in Virginia. A housing guide is a person who is paid through Medicaid to help individuals find housing. So they are supposed to be the experts in their area so someone may be in Roanoke, someone may be a housing guide in Northern Virginia or Virginia Beach. Those people know the area, they know the options, they know all about housing and they can guide you and even take you on tours of different types of housing to help you make an informed decision. Um, number five, the type of housing. Is a high rise apartment okay? Are they able to get up and down you know, the stairs in case of an emergency? Um, or do they use a wheelchair? Do they need to be on the first floor? 
Um, do they want to be in a small group home, which is a house with several rooms with different people living in it? Do they want to be staying at home with you? And maybe you, you know, um, set up the basement for them so that they have their own living space. So you want to determine what type of housing is best for your situation. Set a timeline, like with everything else in life. Get all of your providers on board, which we talked about just a minute ago. Make sure everybody knows this is the plan, this is what we're thinking, and how can you help us? And then set up supports now for a smooth and safe transition, which means anything that you're hearing about today during this workshop, start making plans to set things up now. Maybe your adult child is still living at home and will still be there for the next year or two, but you can set up supports in your home as kind of a trial and then leave them home alone for a while if they've never done that. Or, you know, go on vacation for a week and see how they do with their new supports. Um, and then on the right-hand side, this is a list of different types of support options. And remember, you're gonna get a copy of this presentation. Um, so you have housing guidance, you can hire drop-in support, which means if, you, if your um, individual doesn't need around-the-clock support, then someone could drop in for a couple of hours a day or night. You can have in-home support that's scheduled anytime, day or night. You get community support through your local CSB. So, you know, they can find help find day programs, activities, college courses, anything that you want or need. Um, you can find help finding a roommate. You can have a live-in aid. So maybe the first step is getting an apartment with two bedrooms, one for the aide and one for your adult child. Remote supports is something that we provide. And again, that's 24 seven access to a live human being for any reason, whether it's just to say hello or whether it's because you know something has really upset someone or they need help with someone or they need medication reminders. Um, and then you have assistive technology, which we'll talk about a little bit further um, today and then environmental modifications. When they get to their new home, apartment, townhouse, whatever it is, do they have everything in place that they need in their environment? Do they need grab bars? Do they need um, a security system? Do they need, you know, what do they need to keep them safe? And then also just setting up your lifetime circle of support, which we have a slide about that. Um, any questions on this slide so far? I know that was a lot of information, but I really wanted to touch on all of these. No questions? All right, we will keep on moving. So this, what I just mentioned, is called the circle of support. The individual is the most important part of this. They are right there in the middle. And then this is all the different types of supports that I just reviewed for that individual. So you really wanna set up the entire circle of support. You could use this almost as a checklist, um, you know, which family members are going to be around and be available and helpful, which advocacy groups can guide us through some of this process like the ARC. Um, all of these different supports you have access to to help your um, adult child, you know, conquer these goals and reach their dreams basically. Did I see something pop up in the chat, you guys? You did. Um, so Sarah asked, is this assuming you have a DD waiver? So a lot of these, you would need a waiver to help pay for. However, a lot of these, um, you can also access without the waiver. So if it's anything, like I'll just use Safe and Home as an example. Our remote supports and the assistive technology that we can provide, which is all the, you know, the devices, whether it's smart home devices or a video doorbell or any of those things, um, those are all covered 100% by the waivers. If you don't have a waiver, then there's other pots of funding that your support coordinator can help you with um, or private pay, of course. But a lot of the community supports and things like that, you, the qualification is that you have a disability. I hope that answered the question. All right, next slide, please. All right, and we, I'm gonna turn it over to Beth Bullard and Loudon, and she will explain what exactly is remote supports. 
Hello, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah, so I think um, Andrea went into a little bit um, about what our remote supports are with Safe and Home, um, but it is a new term, I think, for a lot of us. Um, but basically, remote supports is in, an opportunity for individuals to connect with someone on the other end, so human to human contact through generally a tablet. So we would provide um, the individual with a tablet to, you know, uh, simply touch the button and then up pops, you know, a human face to say, hello, how are you? Check in with them on goals or just be there to answer questions and concerns. Um, it's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, no matter what, you know, so they're always there, which is kind of nice for those that have, um, you know, like, maybe anxiety or concerns about their direct support not showing up on time or um, things that have happened in the past where they're concerned about, um, you know, someone not showing up or just being, um, you know, feeling, starting to feel a little bit lonely or, you know, being alone for the first time in their new environment. So again, this can be if they're living um, at home with family, with a roommate, or going off on their own for the first time independently in their own apartment or house. Um, our remote supports can work with other assistive technology, which is kind of demonstrated here. Um, we have, like Andrea said, our, you know, different types of assistive technology, which is kind of like the devices, like the um, Ring doorbell, um, Amazon Echo, different types of um, smart devices in the home to keep people safe or to communicate with their care circle. And then our remote support staffs can kind of check in with them on how everything is going, you know, during the day. And if all of those are working properly and, you know, working for them to meet their goals. Um, so we can answer, you know, any questions that you have about remote supports and kind of get into how that would work for you or your loved one. But um, I'll kind of just let it, um, you, you know, maybe sit there just generally because it is in individualized and different for each person that we that we work with. But are there any questions right now, I guess, in the chat that we can address? And I do want to mention just something really quick. And that was an ex excellent um, description, Beth. Thank you. Um, we have been providing remote supports in many <clears throat> other states for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Um, the state of Ohio is the leader in supporting their IDDD population, and they use remote supports to get people off the wait list, to fill DSP um, uh, positions that can't be filled, um, and they have basically turned it into a regulation or made it part of their regulations that remote supports is a, a thing that Ohioans need to be using and should be using. The state of Indiana is also um, on the cutting edge of supporting their IDDD population. Virginia, we're a little behind. We have a lot of regulations that need to be changed. We're doing our best to help, um, you know, promote more supports for the IDDD population. Um, currently we're supporting about 1300 people in approximately eight states across the country. We have about 400 people on service here in Virginia. And um, I think that's it. That's all the statistics that I wanted to throw at you guys. Were there any questions for Beth? Yes, one just came in. Can the remote supports be tailored for someone with only mental health disability who is on SSDI, SSI, if we private pay? Um, yes, we can certainly work with private pay for um, all individuals. That's right, Andrea, right? I mean, there's really no limitations. Um, we would, of course, do a consult with the family, you know, with the care circle and the individual to make sure that supports are appropriate and that they were you know, aligned with the goals that everyone had, but um, we can certainly, you know, work with with all sorts of individuals and um, align the services appropriately, I think. Right, and I will mention that remote supports is $6.88 an hour. 
So compared to an in-home aid, which I don't even know the rate now in Virginia, is it $24 an hour or something like that? Maybe more? I have no idea. Um, but $6.88 um, and you get 24 seven support. So as long as an individual doesn't need hands-on support, then they can use remote supports. If they are using remote supports and do need someone to be there in person to help them, then we can always have a phone number that we call to call someone in for that help. So um, just think about that. We have another question in the chat. <clears throat> Can you start using these devices and remote support in the parent's home to train and accommodate the client prior to using in more independent setting? Yes, and thank you so much for that question because that is um, kind of the perfect scenario and way to um, start remote supports when there is gonna be a transition um, in housing because it does kind of give um, you know your individual a, um, kind of like a baseline, you know, um, a comfort level with remote supports and somebody that they can go to and feel comfortable with, and then they can transition with that service rather than starting everything at once when they are also moving and starting that whole new um, stage of their life. So it is a great idea to start it beforehand and get that going, and then they can take that with them. So perfect question. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Oh, we can see, you can see my messages. Somebody said, no, okay. Um, all right, next slide. Thank you, Beth. Mm -hmm. That was perfect. Okay, so we're about to get to the success stories, um, but really quickly, I had an opportunity um, last week in Indiana to talk to a group, a big group of different types of supports and providers. And they made it, abundantly clear that over support is an actual issue. We learned a lot in the pandemic. Um, it brought to light the fact that many individuals actually thrive with less support. So you may have someone who's having some behaviors. You don't know why, you can't figure it out. You've tried everything. And it may just be that they want some time to themselves. One of the providers even mentioned that they had um, a young man who had gone from group home to group home to group home was completely unsatisfied. As soon as he moved in, he wanted to move right back out. So finally, on I think it was the fifth group home, they decided, okay, maybe he doesn't need one-on-one -on -one support. Um, let's just you know, let him have his evenings, his nights to himself and see how it goes. And it worked. He's been there, I think they said six months now, hasn't asked to move. So it was a huge accomplishment. And it's just because he really wanted, he didn't know how to say it, but he wanted some time to himself. He wanted his privacy. Um, the staffing shortage is real. It's very, very difficult to fill, um, to feel, to fill um, DSP positions. And um, so we're finding that we're having to evolve. I mean, we're all used to Zoom. We're all used to using technology. We have doctor's appointments virtually now and all kinds of things, group activities virtually. So <clears throat> remote supports is evolving and it's becoming a more natural part of supporting an individual. Um, as I said, they are finding that people are thriving with less support. Um, <clears throat> we also have an individual I love him, one of our Northern Virginia, Ben, again, that I mentioned earlier. Um, when I went on the consultation with Ben, he had this beautiful um, art piece of artwork of Abe Lincoln. And I don't know what it's called. It's not pointillism, but it's something where you take a lot of tiny little images and you create a larger image. So it was one of those types of artwork. And I should have looked that up before today, but I didn't do it. Anyway, during the consultation, his mom said, you know, what are you most excited about, about, you know, moving into your own apartment and having these supports? And he said um, that he felt like he was emancipated. And I thought that was so powerful because there he pointed to Abe Lincoln. He's non-speaking, but he uses the letter board to speak. Um, and that's exactly what he said. And I thought that, that was so power, so powerful. So think about that. Um, there's also something called dignity of risk. All of us 
as humans have been able to make our own decisions, make our own choices. Sometimes we're successful and we make the right choice. Sometimes we make a bad decision or the wrong choice. And, you know, we learn from it, right? <clears throat> so that is dignity of risk, giving that someone the opportunity to take that risk, whether it's big or small, and learn from it. <clears throat> um, and then also keep in mind that support is fluid. It can change. It's very dynamic. You can start with a certain type of supports, maybe in-home supports and, you know, <clears throat> sorry, allergies, um, eight hours a day of a DSP coming into the home, but that can change. It can change on a daily basis. So can remote supports. So you may want us to do check-in calls to an individual um, at 8 a.m. to make sure that they're up and getting ready for their part-time job. And then again at 6 p.m. to make sure that they've taken their medications. But that can change because we all experience change. And um, I think that's it. So next slide, please. Okay, so here's the here we get into the success stories. And I love talking about these individuals. And we're gonna start with a very, very short video. You can see this full video on our YouTube site, but this is a short video of Emma who lives in Northern Virginia. Give me a second. I'm gonna pull the link from the chat and stop and, and see actually if that works a little bit easier for us to do this. I'm not hearing anything, Lucy. Okay, so I... And I did see someone in the chat mention My Ben. Ben does have Unfortunately, a early in that journey, we came across- Can you hear now? Safe and home. Yes. The main thing we're using our safe and home uh, It's just a few for seconds, so I'm gonna restart it because I think part of the beginning is really critical. Emma is a 24-year-old autistic. She has a seizure disorder and she is what we refer to as unreliable speaker. I asked her if she could ever see herself living in her own apartment, and she said, yes, that's absolutely what I want for my life. And fortunately, early in that journey, we came across our friends at Safe and Home. The main thing we're using our Safe and Home tablet for now is for check-ins. We have to have a way to be able to check on her. She has to be able to reach out to us Emma and her friends should be able to go out for a walk by themselves. But with all of them wearing the device, we know if anything goes wrong, we could always find them with the GPS system. I mean, we cannot fake the joy that she is experiencing in her life. I mean, she is living a self-determined life. This is what she wants and she's doing it and we could not be prouder. Thank you, Lucy. So again, you can see the full video of Emma on our YouTube channel. And let me just pull up the question about Ben. It says, doesn't Ben have a living caregiver? That makes a big difference in this scenario, right? And oops, I lost it. Hold on. You guys still with me? Give me just a second. You're fine. Vimeo okay. won't let me stop because of the way my screen is set up to be full screen. So I'm going to get that closed off before I go back to screen sharing. Give me just a second. And the question about Ben is, does he does have a living caregiver. The goal is that he may not have to have that living caregiver. And the, the living caregiver, I know sometimes um, she steps out and Ben has um, some time at home alone. So again, his biggest goal was to go to the grocery store by himself. I don't actually know if he has been able to do that yet or not, but, but you're right. As far as, as things, success stories go, details like that are very, very important. Um, especially, you know, for Ben, because he is non-speaking, um, it may be a little bit longer road for him before he can live on his own. I'm not sure. It just depends on, you know, what are his goals? What is the reality? So um, next slide, please. All right, so I have changed these names, but these are real stories about real people and I will get as detailed as you all want me to get. Um, this is Lucy. She, her 
Her goal is to feel safe and secure in her home and community. She wants to live alone with her dog, Leon, knowing that she has support when she needs it. So this individual, she has mild ID. Other than that, she doesn't have any physical disabilities. Um, she did have a seizure disorder, uh, but it, that is being completely, um, I can't think of the word. She's on medication and she hasn't had seizures in many, many years. So um, she lives in a, an apartment building in Fairfax Corner. It's a gated community. Um, she lives on the second floor with her dog and she does live there alone. Um, one of the things that she is mainly concerned with is that sometimes she forgets her keys, which has her fob to get in the gate code. And then she gets locked out. And because of her mild ID, she has a hard time remembering things like the security gate code. So what she does is she uses one of our geocom devices, the little SOS push button. And if she goes out for running her errands and forgets her keys, she can push that button and we know to call one of the five people that have her gate code and get that gate code for her. And um, we also have the gate code, but um, just in case she needs further help, um, we can contact those people as well. Um, so that's the primary thing that, that she uses at her apartments. She's also very, very social and she likes to have visitors. She likes to call people. So she does use, use remote support um, as, as kind of just to, to say hello, to keep in touch when she's feeling a little bit lonely. She has worked with a company called Inclusion Consultants and they have found all of her activities in the community. Um, they provide transportation for her because she, she cannot drive. Um, she also uses the bus system um, in Fairfax Corner. Um, she has day programs that she goes to. She likes to take walks. It's the perfect area for her to do that. She likes to go window shopping. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and then she has other assistive technology in her apartment. Um, she has a medication box so that she can take her own meds without forgetting to make sure that that ensures that she takes the right dose on time. Okay. Um, any questions about Lucy before we move on? That's okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, let's go to the next slide. And remember, at the beginning of this presentation, I said, if this is not the exact scenario of your adult child, that's okay. Um, just listen to bits and pieces of these stories and, and find some similarities. <clears throat> okay, so now we have Jack. He wanted, he and his care circle both wanted um, to ensure that he was safe going to and from his job. He loves his job. That is the main reason that he wakes up every morning is because he wants to go to work. He loves his job. Um, he also has a tendency to call his parents a lot. Um, and they wanted to see if there was a way to, you know, have him realize that he could rely on someone other than mom and dad. Um, he also didn't want to hear back from mom and dad. So it was kind of a two-way street with him. He liked to call his parents, but he did not want them to call him and remind him to do things. You know, the nagging parent, parent syndrome. Um, they were also suspecting that he was staying up too late on electronics at night because some days he was just tired and cranky and um, had a tough time waking up. Um, so um, a little bit more about him. He lives in a high-rise apartment building in Arlington. He had recently moved out of his parents' home when we met him. And he loves his job, like I said, but sometimes he gets sleepy in the morning. He might miss his Uber or forgets to set his alarm. So those are the things that they really wanted help with. <clears throat> he um, had initially talked to the ARC to help him identify, you know, supports and housing and, and things like that. He found his job through DARS, <clears throat> which most of you are probably familiar with. He chose his apartment because it was just a few miles from the job that he loves. And then he uses assist, assistive technology because on his front door, there is a, um, we have a, a door alert. So when that door opens and closes between a certain, we can program it to send an alert to his parents 
for specific times of day. So on work days, we can program that door alert to send an open close alert to his parents between let's say 7.30 a.m. and 8.30 a.m., which lets them know that he's left for work without them having to call and check on him. Um, and just, you know, he uses some other things like that as well. Um, he uses, he also uses the geocom so that if he needs any help on the job, he doesn't have to get out a cell phone. He can just very discreetly step aside and reach out. Um, he does work with a behavioral therapist. So what we determined together was to place some motion sensors throughout his apartment and the motion sensors, they're not cameras. What they do is they look for movement or lack of movement in someone's space. So you can pull up a report and you can see exactly where Jack has gone, what time of day. So we determined, or we saw on the reports that he was getting up multiple times a night. So we, along with the behavioral therapist, had to you know, do our detective work and figure out why. Was he drinking too many liquids before bed? You know, was he getting up and getting on his computer? Things like that. So those reports really helped us curb some of those behaviors so that he could get up in the morning and not stay up so late. We also provide um, wake up calls to make sure that he's up and ready for his day. And then we also have, we call them tuck in calls um, just to see how his day was and make sure that all of his electron electronics are turned off. Okay, next slide. And I have no idea how we're doing on time. I don't have my clock up, but hopefully- We I'm have not... about 10 minutes left, give or take. Oh, goodness. Okay, so I'm gonna talk fast. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so very quickly, Deborah. She, her goals were taking her medications independently, remembering to eat in the morning with her medications. Um, she loves to go out for walks. So she wanted to make sure that someone knew that she was going out for walks because she is a falls risk. Um, and then she needed help identifying why she was excessively tired in the mid afternoons. So Deborah actually lives in one of the cluster apartments that I was talking about. Um, she found it through our stomping ground, which is also where Emma and Ben, they live um, in an apartment secured through our stomping ground. Those are clusters again, because there are apartments that are all in a row, they can share supports, they can share activities, they can do group activities, and they're all there just to build community. Um, where was I? So she has a roommate who provides overnight supports, but her roommate goes to college, and so she's gone during the day. And she does have breakthrough seizures, um, so she is using some of our seizure alert assistive technology. I'm not going to go into detail about that right now, but so she uses the seizure alert um, assistive tech. She uses remote supports for medication reminders. She does have a pill box so that she can take her own meds. And I think that's it for Deborah. Next slide. <clears throat> Andrea, okay. we have a few questions. Did you want to take any questions? Or you want to wait till after you get through the Let's wait till after. I think this is the last success story that we'll talk about. So let me get Perfect. through this really quick. Thank you. So Daniel. He wanted to increase his independence. He has Tatten Brown Raman syndrome. I hope I'm saying that correctly, um, which is an overgrowth um, chromosome, I believe, um, that typically causes overeating. Um, he, you have to get a lot of exercise and watch what you're eating because with this syndrome, you tend to just want to eat all the time and eat whatever. You know, there's just nothing that's telling you, okay, I need to eat an apple or a banana instead of this Snickers bar. Um, so he was, when we met him, he was moving out of his parents' townhouse and they actually secured a townhouse just four townhouses down, which was pretty cool. So he is living on his own now, but mainly wanted support to help him with the overeating and remind him to get a, you know, his daily exercise. He had gone through Moms in Motion for guidance on, on all things, you know, AT, housing, all of those things. Um, he does have day support um, so that he has his social interactions and we help him um, get outside during the day. He's involved in drama. He actually is a participant now in the Special Olympics. Um, so that's kind of a cool story. 
and we provide daily check-ins because he needs to review his grocery list because he tries to do his shopping on his own and he's very forgetful about locking his front door. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, before I take the questions, I just want to really quickly go through some advice that we have heard from parents who we've worked with. What do they wish that they had done differently um, when they were planning on greater independence or housing? So started the process much sooner. Um, they feel like their, their adult children could have done this much earlier, but they were, they were nervous. They were scared about doing it. Um, get supports set up earlier. So do it now while they're still living at home. See how it goes. You may go through several different types of supports to, and before you find the right one for your son or daughter. Consider the location. Do they need transportation? Is it going to be near a job? Are they social? Do they need that you know, sense of community? Or do they need to be in a less chaotic area because they you know, wouldn't wanna contend with traffic and things like that? Um, coordinate or put together a meeting with service providers and supports, like I mentioned earlier, to get everybody on the same page. Set up your circle of support. Realize honestly with yourself that moving out is not, and all of the supports are not mom 2.0. Nobody's going to be mom like you are mom or dad. Nobody's going to do as good a job as you. So you have to get used to that fact and choose your battles and just, you know, some things aren't going to be perfect, but a lot of the parents said that they were really hard on themselves initially. Um, and then they wish that they had heard about remote supports. Again, this is fairly new in Virginia. Other states, they know exactly what it is. They've been doing it for years, but here it's new. New is scary. So um, learn about it, do your research, talk to us and see if it's the right fit for you. All right, next slide. And this is just to end on a really positive note. Think about the day and get excited about the day that your adult child is choosing between a one or a two bedroom apartment. Think about that. We've all done it. Your child can, can get there, they can do that. Um, think about the day that they call just to say hello, that they don't need something, that it's not an emergency, that they're happy, they're secure, they feel secure and they just call to say hello. Think about the day that their independence just takes off and your jaw is dropping like, wow, I had no idea that my son or daughter was capable of doing these things. And then think about the day that they themselves are advocating for themselves and breaking down their own barriers or barriers for other people. All right, next slide. I think that's it. Oh, one more slide. Um, so very quickly, Beth, do you want to go through this slide? This is just an overview really quickly about Safe and Home. We tried to make this not all about Safe and Home, um, but we do want you to know some of the, the you know, facts about us. Sure. Okay. So, um, yes. Yeah, so Safe and Home, like, like Andrea said, we um, are, have been here in Virginia a little over two years. So, um, you know, some people have been using us for two years in different counties and others were new too, but we are very consistent in what we do nationally and have had wonderful success with those that we are working with. And we do provide both assistive technology and also the remote supports that we've talked a lot about today. Um, and when we do work with individuals, it is, um, you know, we are working with them to be empowering and not directive with them and really kind of having that person-centered approach so that it's meeting them, you know, where they're at. So when we call them, it's not going through a list of to-dos or directing them or, um, you know, that's not what really what a check-in call is for. It's more about making them feel um, confident in themselves and, you know, what would they like to do and what kind of goals do they have for themselves and how are they going to have a successful day? And whether well, it's a small goal or a long-term goal that they're working towards, how can we be a part of that? 
Um, in addition to that, you know, we're, the goals that we're working on are part of the ones that they're setting with their support coordinator, with their care circle, um, with other, you know, maybe the people at work or their um, at school and their community. So it's just part of the entire um, program that they're a part of. Um, so again, it's available 24 seven and it is often used as a part of um, direct support as well. So some, we have a lot of people that might use, you know, remote supports for maybe like an hour a day. You have a check-in call and just know that they're able to call in when someone is not there with them. And then they have, um, you know, direct support come in for eight hours a day when they're there and then maybe they're at work for the rest of that time. So it can be used in so many different ways, indiv individualized for the person, um, just whatever works. Other people just like to have it at night through the nighttime hours so that they know they can call in if something goes wrong for emergency use. And we'll just have a con consultation with the care circle, support coordinator, with the individual and just decide what might work for you. And this is 100% um, covered under the Medicaid IDD waivers. So that's all four waivers that we have here in Virginia. Um, and we say 100% covered, but that's, um, I'll just say that's $5,000 a year is what they have allotted for this um, embar embar um, electronic home-based services, which is what the remote support is built under here in Virginia. Um, I think that kind of covers safe and home as a whole. Is there anything else, Andrea, that I should add to that? I don't think so. Um, I will- Do we get through some of these questions maybe? Yeah, let's, let's do that real quick. And I do wanna mention that only 8% of assistive technology funds are used every year, 8%. So all, everyone on the waivers has $5,000 per year. So $5,000 annually for assistive technology like the smart home devices. They also have $5,000 a year for EHBS, which is where we bill remote supports. And we're the only remote supports provider right now. So that's the whole 5,000 there. So mm -hmm. that's $2,000, only 8% of the AT is used and probably less than 1% of the electronic home-based supports is used per year in Virginia. So it's there for your um, adult and child to use. Okay, let's get through some of the questions. Gonna and I'm hop gonna... on and try and help wiggle us through some of these questions. We got a question okay. that I can answer real quick about the example of Lucy and does the waiver subsidize housing costs? Great. As a federal rule, Medicaid waiver cannot pay for rent in any setting, period, end of the line. Always. <gasps> waiver pays for supports. That can be remote supports like we've talked about here. It can be in-person staff supports. It can be all kinds of things. Social security is designed to pay for rent and rental costs that can be supplemented with things like housing vouchers that help pay for rent. And so the discussion about how to pay for like the bricks and mortar, the physical housing itself is usually a combination of, unless you're living in a group home where they take a very large percentage of someone's income, it's usually a combination of social security and a rental voucher or some other kinds of creative solutions. And I'll send out some resources about housing funding and kind of looking at like the bricks and mortar piece of it too. Um, when we had a question about medication boxes, can someone give a, a brief overview of what those look like? Sure, Beth. Sure, yeah. So, um, oh, I wish I had it here with me, but um, we have a couple different um, solutions for medication dispensing. Um, the, the, I guess the goal is to help people to become, um, you know, more compliant with their medication, taking it on time in the correct dosage, um, it can also help, you know, your care circle, or um, even if you have different staff coming in, switching, you know, at different times, they can see that, okay, yes, the medication has been taken. Um, everybody's kind of on the same page. The one that I like is kind of like a disc shape. It's about this big and it holds about three weeks worth of medication generally, and it can be filled up and then um, it goes off by alarm. So we can help initially to set that up with you. And then, um, you know, filling the, the pill, it's, it's for pills, not for liquid medication, but filling that up for the different times of day and the different medications. And then the alarm goes off and it doesn't stop until that um, 
disc is actually flipped over and that one medication pops out um, for the person to take. So um, that's kind of how that one goes. It's, you know, the alarm goes off, doesn't stop until you take it. And then we all know the medication has been taken and then, you know, it doesn't go off again until that next medication is due. Um, so that's a great one. I mean, I, <laughs> a lot of people um, get the medication dispensers just because it is great for compliance for um, any, I've even had people that are on, on, you know, lots of kind of um, natural supplements for different types of, you know, medical conditions. And they like to take that for, use that for that as well. It just is great for different times of day and staying organized. I want to make sure that we're respectful of folks time so we'll go ahead and wrap it up but when I send out my follow up email at safe and home was very generous about sharing a handout with more resources I'll share resources to the kinds of things that we talked about today you can reach out to them a huge part of what they do is this right these personalized technology assessments where instead of asking in a group with this much information you're sharing in a chat you can really say let's talk about the whole picture of our life and let's come up with something that's custom created for my loved one and they are incredibly talented at doing this. So thank them so much for being here. We are grateful that you all came and asked great questions and listened. Um, as we move toward a situation where people in general use more technology and it is significantly harder to find one-to-one -one in person direct caregiving staff, we are seeing lots of doors being opened um, for people of all kinds of abilities and needs through the sorts of things that Safe and Home is doing. So thank you all just for doing it <laughs> way beyond being here today. We are so grateful to be partners with you. Thank everyone for coming um, and I will send out recordings. If you were watching this recording in hindsight on YouTube, you can always go to the arcofnova.org and click information and referral at the top of the page and say, hey, can I get a copy of that handout? Can I get a copy of those slides? And I am a digital organized porter and I will give you the copies of everything forever always. So don't you worry about it. Thank you all so much for being with us and have a great day.